Hello everyone, this series is in continuation to the earlier video which was regarding the UPSC CSC option Commerce and Accountancy Means 2020 paper uh, the guidance that was given I hope you worked on that now we will be taking each of the questions that came in this year's paper and we will be discussing one thing I'd like to point out at the outset is the fact that answer writing in an optional paper is must because we presume that everyone knows a bare minimum of the syllabus that has been mentioned. What sets you apart from your competitors is the way you write answers and the way you present them. Now, for example, this number differs from the optional taken. But let us, for example, take about 250 students write the commerce and accountancy optional paper. And therefore, what sets you apart is the way that you write the answers. Your answers must reflect your knowledge and also reflect your clear articulation. It is always better to give examples wherever possible. And it's also not all about cramming up, although a lot of facts have to be remembered. But the analysis of the same and the evolution of the same with respect to the current scenario and the contemporary times is also a must. Also care must be taken that everything is finished within the time limits. So it's better if you do a lot of practice, write full length test papers in the same pattern as asked by the UPSC. A lot of you tend to ignore the previous year papers, which is not the right approach. You must firstly go through all the previous year papers because a number of questions have been repeated. So without uh, further ado, let's start with the answer discussion. First, I'll be taking five questions from each paper. I've chosen paper two first because it's theory and there's a lot of scope uh, when it comes to theory to gain marks. Uh, contrary to the popular belief where it is stated that in practical the discretion is less, I agree that is true. But the theory has a lot of scope wherein you can show the examiner the knowledge that you possess. And it is often seen that practical questions might be a little tricky for some but then theory can always act as your savior. So please, please, please focus upon theory. And it is my personal advice to all out there that sufficient answer writing before the mains paper is required. Let us take up the first question. We all know that the first question is a mandatory one in the optional. And therefore it is better if we revise this first. Question number one says, explain each of the following in, in about 150 words. This is for 10 marks. The first one is line and staff conflicts and their resolutions. This question has been taken from human resource management and is a part of the organization structure. In this question, it is better if we first explain what line and staff is. So in the intro, we can start with the line and staff definition. We can say that the line authority is a commanding authority which is responsible for execution of orders and staff authority is the supplement authority which is responsible for advising the line authority. So there are two words which can be used in the answer to add value to your answer. These are performance responsibility and advice responsibility. It's better if you use these terms. Now in the body, we try and construct a structure wherein we'll answer the question. Firstly, we'll address the conflict and the reasons of the conflict. We will show both the sides of the coin. Therefore, we will say that the line authority has th these problems with the staff authority. The staff authority has this problem with the line authority. So we can say that we will write about the line's point of view and then we will write about the staff point of view. Next, once we've enumerated the conflicts, this will take up the major chunk of the answer because this is what is asked. Then the second thing that has to be covered is how to actually solve this conflict. So the solution has to be covered in the next point. These two things will make up our body part of the answer. The last thing in the conclusion, it is always better to have a forward looking conclusion. Herein we will say that uh, in the modern organizations, this distinction between the line and staff authority has actually become obsolete. Now this is a very, very general framework of the answer and believe me, everyone is going to write this. 
how can you make your answer stand apart is the fact that you use diagrams into it and then convey your ideas through the set diagram for example this is the type of diagram that you can use here in you can write the arguments from the line point of view and here in you can write the arguments from the staff point of view now from the line point of view we can say that they argue that the staff authority is not directly responsible for the work that is performed and that is actually encroaching their authority they also have a theoretical bias wherein they are not engaged in the performance of the work on ground therefore they have these ideas which cannot be actually implemented and if at all they are implemented they are blamed of the credit that they are stealing from the line authority they have a limited and a narrow view this is all what line authority says about the staff authority now what the staff authority says it says that it faces resistance from the line authority there is no innovation there is no consultation and if at all they are giving the advice it is often neglected so once you have enumerated all the arguments from each party's side now you want to tell the examiner that you know what the conflict is and how you can resolve it now in the diagram you can add how to resolve the conflict so in the conflict resolution will be the common part of the venn diagram we can resolve the conflict through information dissemination only when the staff authority knows what actual problems are occurring on the ground can they provide relevant and practical advice and there also needs to be a greater acceptance of advice by the line authority there needs to be a organization culture and an atmosphere where harmony is there between the line and the staff authority there is also a requirement of mutual understanding of how delegation works and the proper chain of command so that there is no confusion with respect to the same this completes the body part of the concept i hope you understand the concept now so in the conclusion you can write that since we are now moving towards more number of mncs multinational companies which are situated in more than one country we see that their operations have become very diverse and complex therefore the distinction between the line and staff function has really become fuzzy and there is no difference between the thinking and the doing functions and in the current scenario we would be witnessing resolution in terms of mitigation of the distinction between the line and staff function i hope this makes the concept clear my intention is not to spoon feed you but just to make you realize that there are n number of ways wherein you can present your answers presentation of the answer really matters because everyone is reading from the same content so if you need those extra marks you'll have to work on the presentation now let us move on to the second question which is about the social system approach of management in this question we can start by introducing the concept of social system approach which was given by chester bernard the second thing that we can write is about the approach itself we can write that chester bernard gave a new view that is the new classical view and we can write about the systems approach wherein we say that each system is comprised of coordinated activities of various subsystems and it is a harmonious synergistic whole of the systems working independently here you can also define the organization as a system of coordinated actions performed consciously for a fixed stated goal in mind but this is something to do with the systems approach and therefore you need to go beyond it now the word social has been added so when we talk about the word social we often tend to think about the human relationships in the system so we talk about the formal authority we talk about the informal organization we talk of the role of a manager and we talk of coordination and communication so therefore in the body we have five sub parts which is one is the theory of formal organization the other one is the organizational equilibrium the third one is the acceptance theory of authority the fourth one is the manager's role and the fifth one is the importance of informal organization so in the theory of formal organization 
Chester Burnett says that a formal organization is a biological cooperative system. Please focus on the word biological because it deals with human and therefore the word social systems approach has been used. And it also says that the interrelationships between people who have a conscious coordination for a systematic objective is important. So the interrelationship is important and the conscious coordination is important. Now formal organization rests upon three pillars which can be highlighted in this form. Draw a triangle and on each edge you can write the pillars. That is the willingness of the people to contribute a proper communication system and the objective of the cooperation must be clearly enunciated. Next, we have the theory of the organizational equilibrium. Now, equilibrium is generally used to denote a kind of balance. So, Chester Burnett says that it is important for organizations to maintain an equilibrium. Equilibrium in terms of what? Equilibrium that is balance in the kind of contribution the employees make for the organization improving their productivity, getting the organization a brand name and the kind of returns that they get from the organization which may include monetary compensation or achievement of their personal goals. So he says that people working in the organizations have two roles. One is the organizational role and the other is the personal role. As long as the personal roles get fulfilled by their contribution to the organization, people feel happy to contribute. They stay in the organization longer and therefore we can say that the organization is a sum total of the employees that work for it. And therefore, there should be a balance between what the employees get out of the organization, that is status, recognition, salary, prestige, etc. And what they contribute in terms of the time they contribute, the knowledge, the effort that they contribute. The next theory that he talks about is the acceptance theory of authority. Contrary to the popular belief that authority flows from top to bottom, it is not so. Authority is considered to be existent only when it is accepted by the subordinate. Therefore, we can say that the authority flows from bottom to top. So now we come on to the manager's role. He says the manager has four roles. Firstly, to stimulate people to work according to their potential. Next, to ensure cooperation between employees, to ensure a proper communication channel is set up and to ensure that purpose of the organization is translated into action by the employees. He also focuses on the importance of informal organization and says that the organizations do not exist in isolation and personal contacts, associations and interactions should be used by the organization and the managers so as to identify the social instincts and personal desires of employees and use them in the formal organization. This brings in cohesiveness in the organization and the formal organization is energized by the informal organization. He also calls these informal organizations as organizational ropes. So this is one of the other things that can be asked as a 10 marker, define organization ropes or also called grapevines. So with this we complete the body part of the answer. Uh, I'd suggest you to keep writing them in points so that the examiner can see the smooth flow of your thoughts in point format. In the conclusion, we can write that social systems approach is one of the neoclassical approach to management. It believes in decentralized structure, informal organizations and gives a more humane approach as opposed to the more mechanical view of the traditional and classical approach. So that's it for this video. The next two questions will be taken up in the next video. If you like such content, please subscribe to the channel and also give it a thumbs up and do share it with your friends. Thank you.